Okay. So um, Pan-Asia Metals uh, has projects in Southeast Asia uh, and in South America. So our projects in Southeast Asia uh, are located in Thailand and Vietnam. So we've got uh, projects in Southeast Asia. They're our pathway to early cash flow and also uh, projects um, in uh, Chile, in South America, and they're our pathway to longer-term volume future growth. So the first question we've got is, is EV real? I think uh, for a lot of our participants today in Asia, this question is easily answered. It certainly is. Uh, but I always like to set, step through some of the um, uh, background information on the lithium market and EV production uh, just to set the scene. So uh, lithium consumption in 2022 was uh, 700,000 tonnes or thereabouts. In 2030, it's, it's forecast to be 3.2 million tonnes and 5.4 million tonnes in 2035. So this is lithium carbon equivalents. So the growth in the market is very large and Pan-Asia Metals is positioning itself to be a participant in this market. What originally started driving um, uh, EV demand were the GHG emissions or uh, the countries focus on reducing those emissions. So policy settings started to the move into EVs and the demand for lithium and batteries. Um, but as we move forward, we can see that the consumer is now starting to drive that demand. So a typical ICE vehicle, as per the chart above, loses 80% of its um, energy uh, to the back wheels, where an EV, electric vehicle in the bottom chart, only loses around 33% of its energy, and it has the advantage of uh, regeneration. So consumers are starting to uh, notice the different difference in their wallet, and that's driving the market. We see in Australia and a lot of Western countries a bit of scepticism here about this and a common meme is uh, a picture like this and it will have a train load of EV fuel, i.e. what's the use of an electric vehicle if it's um, being fired by a coal-powered uh, power station. Uh, looking at that chart beforehand, the advantage is that the energy is used more efficiently and most of it gets to the rear wheels. So even if there is a transition period using coal or energy from coal-fired power stations, we don't really believe this is an, an issue because clearly uh, EVs are much more efficient. And the proof is in the pudding. Uh, in uh, most Asian markets, if not all of them, we're seeing um, taxis, uh, electric vehicle or electric taxis. Uh, if taxi drivers in countries like Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, Thailand uh, can make a living using or driving an electric vehicle taxi, then that, that proves how efficient they are. So there's no issues with taxis, uh, with EVs, and we see a lot a big growth in the market. But the key is, where will all the EVs be made? And this is the big question on most people's minds. And there's a lot of activity in the EU and the US about securing their place in the EV supply chain. But the reality is that over 55% of ICE vehicles are manufactured in Asia. That's India, China, and Southeast Asia, uh, uh, Korea and Japan, of course. So Northeast, North Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, and over 90% of bikes are manufactured in Asia too. And we don't see this changing. Uh, we see that um, the ICE manufacturers in most of these environments um, and the governments have policy settings to move into EVs and the Asian market's not going to let it go. And this is why Pan-Asia Metals is focused on uh, producing raw material in Asia and value adding in, in Asia for the Asian market. This is, our, this is our customer base right where we are. And we're seeing this dynamic in Southeast Asia, similar to the Tigers and Cubs uh, back in the 70s and 80s with a lot of movement of manufacturing then out of Hong Kong, Korea, uh, Japan and Taiwan into Southeast Asia. With EVs, we're seeing a, a slight change and there's a lot of activity from Chinese companies, Koreans and Japanese companies and companies out of Taiwan moving into Southeast Asia. And the four key target companies are Vietnam, uh, Thailand, Malaysia and uh, Indonesia. So Pan-Asia Metals has a presence in Vietnam and Thailand. And the reason is that there's a lot of activity there. And this is why we're, we're focused. 
We have industrial rankings there, big red numbers, and we can see that Thailand's ranked 23, which is behind China at number 18. This is industrial complexity, and uh, we've got uh, Korea at three and Japan at one. So there's a lot of activity in Southeast Asia, and there's a lot of movement into uh, uh, EVs and batteries. In Thailand, where our beachhead project is, the Rionket Lithium Project, which is located just out of Phuket, uh, uh, Thailand is the fourth largest auto manufacturer in Asia uh, and the uh, largest in Southeast Asia. The Thai policy setting is set on retaining this position. And we can see here that Mercedes is already producing its flagship EQS EV in Thailand. So uh, if you see that on uh, the roads in uh, Southeast Asian and uh, Pacific countries, uh, such as Australia, it was made in Thailand. BYD is um, has its factory under construction in Thailand. Great Wall Motors is looking to set up uh, Thailand as its Asian EV hub. And then there's many smaller companies like uh, Hoson um, who are setting up manufacturing in Thailand. There's also, of course, Korean and Japanese companies and a whole lot of uh, suppliers to these OEMs. And this can be seen here. We've got a lot of um, uh, Chinese, Korean and Japanese companies here, uh, but we've also got some Thai companies. Uh, we've got PTT and IRPC, which are looking to participate in the market and so on. So the region uh, is very busy and is getting busier. So this all matters. And the reason I give this background, because the next question is, where are we? Which I've slightly answered already. But Pan-Asia Metals is located right in the centre of it. Uh, in Vietnam, we have a uh, MOU with a group called VinES, a sister company to VinFast for a lithium conversion facility. And in Thailand, Pan-Asia Metals has an MOU with IRPC for a its concentrate to CAM initiative where it plans to mine, produce a basic concentrate, convert it into LCE, uh, most probably lithium carbonate, and then into cathode active materials. So onto our projects and what PAM's about. First, we'll start with uh, Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, Southeast Asia is our pathway to early cash flow. These projects are reasonably advanced. We're a long way down, down the track on, track on feasibility studies with our OEM partners in both Vietnam and uh, um, Thailand. So in Thailand, uh, Pan-Asia Metals has entered into a MOU with IRPC. Uh, IRPC is a Thai listed company with a US market cap of 1.2 billion. But IRPC is 50% owned or 45% owned by PTT, uh, one of the largest uh, oil and gas companies in Southeast Asia, which has got a big electrification push on. They're valued at US 30 billion. And PTT has entered into joint ventures with CATL Goshen to produce or uh, uh, assemble batteries there and Foxconn uh, to assemble EVs there. So in Thailand, our objective is to um, develop our uh, mining projects uh, in southern Thailand, um, process um, a, or produce a concentrate, then process a, uh, into a lithium chemical, LCE, and then our stretch target um, is to produce a cathode active material, and this would be supplying the LIB and EV manufacturers uh, in Thailand. So this is the PAM advantage in there. The IRPC is, uh, has a lot of industrial estates. This one shown here is in Rayong, south of Bangkok, and we've already, um, uh, already identified sites to build a lithium conversion facility. Um, concentrate would be shipped up from uh, southern Thailand, and you can see this big shipping deep water um, dock here. The concentrates would be um, uh, offloaded here and then processed in the industrial park in the back of the picture. In Vietnam, uh, we have a MOU with Vinfa, uh, Vin ES. Vin ES is a, a, small, a small but growing battery producer producing batteries for handhelds, stationary storage and EVs. Uh, with its EV batteries going to VinFast, which recently flowed to the NASDAQ. 
So um, Vinfast has a market cap of around US 40 billion and Goshen, again, with a, a market cap of around 5.6 billion. So both in Vietnam and Thailand, we're keeping very good company. So our objective here is to use third-party concentrates, which would be sourced from uh, uh, most likely from Australia and West Africa, uh, pro process uh, and produce a lithium chemical, an LCE, and uh, that would be delivered to Vinfast and other battery manufacturers in uh, Vietnam, uh, possibly China, possibly Korea and Japan. Uh, and our stretch target there too is to look at producing uh, cathode active materials as a stretch target. As I mentioned, VIN ES uh, is a, is a, has a full suite of battery manu manufacturing capabilities, producing batteries for power tools, uh, uh, stationary storage, and electric vehicles. On to uh, Pan Asia Metals projects. So, Pan Asia Metals, its beachhead project, its key project, is in southern Thailand, about 40 minutes drive out of Phuket. It's called the RK Lithium Project. The RK Lithium Project has two prospects you can see here. One is to the south, um, it's uh, uh, called the RK Lee Prospect, and one is to the north, called the BT Lee Prospect. At RK, we've got a, uh, a resource, generated mineral resource of 10.4 million tonnes at 0.44% Li2O. Don't let the grade worry you. Um, it's a lapidolite style, and we'll discuss grade and how we're addressing that. And we're expecting a resource upgrade uh, very, very soon. At our BT prospect in the north, we've got a drill-supported exploration target of 16 to 25 million tonnes at 0.4 to 0.7% Li2O. And we're drilling this out now to produce a, um, a resource. And our objective is to achieve a global resource at these two projects of around 30 to 40 million tonnes, which is ample for um, uh, over 10 years production at 10,000 tonnes per annum uh, LCE. Uh, we're obviously aiming for more than that. These prospects are loaded, located eight kilometres away from each other, so we can have a central processing plant um, and, and share infrastructure uh, and uh, assets. We can see on the right that passing the RK Lithium project just through here, um, a, there's a, a very, very good uh, infrastructure uh, with power lines. So you can see the big, big power lines here. So there's ample um, uh, infrastructure for the projects. And on this grid um, is a hydro power station. So we can uh, look at producing a green product using uh, energy from the grid and also uh, complemented by solar, uh, solar power. The project itself, uh, this is the RK Lithium project, um, has had 102 diamond drill holes uh, put into it. And you can see here this cross section, B to B is here. And what you can see is a pegmatite dark swarm. So this is where my comment on grade shouldn't worry you. Um, I mentioned that our grade right now is 0.44%, but you can see in the pegmatite dark swarm that there are many pegmatites intersected at plus 1%, uh, and they typically average um, uh, 06 to 0.8%. So the reason the resource grade is low is because the resource model captures some of the zero to very low grade material between the pegmatites. At BT Prospect, eight kilometres to the north, it's similar. Um, we're up to around hole 40 by now, uh, and it's a pegmatite dike swarm, you can see here. And you can see also that the grades are very high. Here's an intersection of 10 metres at 0.98%. Uh, 1.3 or uh, 3 metres at 1.3 percent. So uh, again, the pegmatite dike swarm, uh, the pegmatites are reasonably high grade to high grade, but the material in between them is low grade and that gets captured in the resource model. Now with regards to uh, the ore, we can do ore sorting. So we've, uh, we've been undertaking metallurgical test work and leaching test work. And one of the first steps was to uh, conduct an ore sort test. And in this case, we started with a, a representative mine sample, which averaged 0.5%, uh, and we had a grade uplift of 0.2%, so nearly double, which would suggest that the actual plant size for processing would just be, be about um, half the uh, size. 
And this is why we don't let the uh, actual resource grade worry us too much because we can upgrade and remove a lot of the uh, below cutoff waste rock. Further, we've conducted metallurgical test work. It's still ongoing. Our latest results show that we could produce up to a 3.6% lithium oxide concentrate, and we've achieved recoveries up to 87% Li2O. This is really important. Uh, many projects are struggling to achieve recoveries much higher than 0.7% um, uh, in Australia. And we also have some spodumin uh, projects and their shipped concentrate grades uh, for their spodumin concentrate is in fact below 4%. So we're not looking too bad. Our roasting and leaching test work results have also yielded good results, ranging up to 88% lithium extraction, uh, which is a good start. And we're still working on that. And we think we can uh, achieve higher, higher, higher lithium into solution results. With regards to grade um, uh, and cost environment, uh, we believe that when we look at a pro when you look at a project, you need to look at uh, not just the tons and grade, but also the metallurgy, which we've discussed, and the cost environment. So uh, here we have a cost curve. Uh, it has uh, several lipidolite projects. These are all based in China, and you can see that they're right at the bottom of the cost curve. So this information was drawn from uh, a Wood Mackenzie report, which was uh, put together for Tianqi. Uh, lithium uh, for its IPO in June last year. So it's in their uh, prospectus. And we've resorted the data into a hard rock cost curve. And we can see these Chinese projects, which are using lipidolite to convert into lithium, are very low cost. Uh, in fact, Yongxing, which is one of the most advanced lipidolite uh, conversion companies, uh, is uh, in 2021 reported that its conversion costs or it was producing LCE for under $6,000 a tonne. Uh, so Yongxing is a benchmark and uh, sets a standard in costs that we'd like to achieve. Uh, in China, the process route being used is very simple. It's a sulfate roast, uh, very well understood. And this is the process route we're adopting at uh, Riong Kit. At the uh, Rion Ket um, 2, just to confirm, we've conducted field test work and we've had very high grade results. You can see from these rock chips um, uh, that we've achieved up to 2.62% Li2O, and these are representative samples. Of the 40, uh, 44 of the 64 samples uh, collected in this field program average 1.56%. So once again, our resource grade of 0.44% doesn't really reflect the potential of the project. Secondly, what I'd like to do is discuss uh, Chile, and uh, this is our pathway to future growth and what we aim to do there. So in Chile, we secured quite a large holding um, uh, in June this year. Uh, Rick Rule said, when, when the market's looking the other way, pounce, and that's what we did in Chile. We managed to secure 1,600 square kilometres of uh, brine and clay properties in the Atacama Desert. These are the most um, strategically situated projects in, South, in the South American market. The reason is they're low altitude. They're very close to infrastructure. Ikiki is 75 k's away. The main North South American highway travels through the projects, as does the Chilean national grid, which is plugged into hydropower in the south. So um, to, to wrap up, uh, well, just one, uh, one of our key projects there, uh, is a brine project and it's 600 square kilometres. Uh, we've got many samples above 1,000 ppm lee, so it's a very high grade project and we'll be looking to drill that um, uh, later this year or early next year. Uh, we have a very advanced ESG program uh, and our view is that uh, we're not an island wherever we operate. Um, we would like to bring our community along with us. If our community thrives, uh, we fr thrive. So uh, thank you very much. Um, explore a better future with Pan Asia Metals. So uh, a couple of questions from the uh, audience, from the investors. Uh, what, what's the main key advantage of, uh, you know, in Southeast Asia over, let's say, Australia or other Western environment? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, we're very focused on cost environment and being located near 
uh, uh, industrial um, or, or ma processing, manufacturing and processing plant. So in Southeast Asia, similar to China, it's a very low cost operating environment. Um, all of our inputs are on our doorstep. So both in Vietnam and Thailand, all our reagents uh, are there um, and our markets are on our doorstep. So uh, we might not have the highest grade spodumene projects, but we do have the advantage of cost environment and proximity to our markets. So will PAM be looking at any other acquisitions in both short term or long term? Uh, that's a good, a good question. Being a public company, I can't really answer that directly, but Pan-Asian Metals just secured the uh, its Tama Atacama lithium project in South America. Uh, it took nine months, months to put that project together, and it's one of the most strategic and largest brine and clay holdings uh, in, in the South Americas. Pan-Asian Metals is always looking at opportunities to advance its um, portfolio holding because we believe that demand for lithium in the future will be so great. Uh, now the time is the time to secure assets. One last question here, and so do you need to secure any any offtake uh, anytime soon? Um, not really. Uh, in Vietnam, um, our MOU with Vin ES, um, uh, its sister company Vinfast, is essentially that's our offtake. Although we would be building a facility which can also supply other OEMs, and we are in discussions uh, with OEMs all the time about supply. In Vietnam, our MOU with IRPC, uh, basically um, the idea would be we'd produce a concentrate and a cathode, act, uh, an LCE, and um, a, a likely home would be PTT and its joint ventures with CATL and Goshen. In South America, we've had preliminary discussions. The idea is to joint venture with a, uh, a big balance sheet OEM to develop those projects. Great, Paul. Thank you for addressing the questions from the investor audience. Thank you for your time today. Thanks, Gilbert. It was a pleasure sharing Pam with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.